Hello and thanks once again for taking the time to download and listen to our podcast from CelticUnderground.net. I'm Harry Brady and this is podcast number 249. <laughs> Over the last 12 months we've had in Scotland The Commonwealth Games The Referendum The Labour Wipeout just a couple of weeks ago And me getting a beat in my bonnet About the value that football generates For the Scottish economy For the Glasgow economy And the lack of feedback on that So this week we have a guest who can talk us through all of those things and give us some insight from his perspective. Former leader of Glasgow City Council, Mr Stephen Purcell. Stephen worked with the late Donald Dewar, became a councillor at 22 and a leader of the city at 32 and was tipped to be a future leader of the Labour Party in Scotland. So he's uniquely placed to provide us with an overview. He was the leader of Glasgow when they won the bidding for the 2014 Commonwealth Games and he didn't get to stand up at Celtic Park and be Mr Shouty Man. So as I said in some tweets over the last week or so, if you're interested in Celtic, Glasgow, the impact sport can make on a city, and just an overview of what's happening in politics in our time here in Scotland, then I think you'll find this an interesting chat now. Also, earlier on tonight, if you're listening this on Thursday, but you're probably not, you listen to it on Friday or Saturday, so anyway, I tweeted that it's an hour and a half long, and I didn't know whether to do two 45 minute podcasts or one, one and a half hour, and it was a 50-50 response, so I decided, mainly because I couldn't be bothered doing two parts to it, to do it as one podcast. If you want a break though, after about an hour, there's a natural point where the subject changes, so if you want to listen to it in two parts, you've got an hour, and then about 40 minutes. But before we get into that podcast, if you want to know some of the usual Celtic FC Foundation chat, there'll be more of it at the end. However, suffice to say, everybody who contributed did a fantastic job because the Celtic FC Foundation badge day and uh, Lisa's 30th birthday bash have raised just under £25,000 between them. There was over 100 volunteers who collected money at the 5-0 drubbing of Inverness Cali when £17,000 was raised that day and £15,000 was raised at the party before the party for the Lisa Haig birthday bash. And if you're wondering why there's a differential between the two figures I've just told you, then the proceeds from the Lisa Haig birthday bash are being shared with Marie Curie Cancer. Anyway, if you want to know more about other things you can participate in to do with the Celtic FC Foundation, then listen to the end of this podcast. And if you want to know more about... All the other stuff that I chatted about. Then this is me, Harry Brady, with him, former leader of Glasgow City Council, former tip for the top of the Labour Party in Scotland, Mr Stephen Fossil. Stephen Fossil, thanks very much for joining us in the Celtic Underground podcast. Absolute pleasure to be here. So before we can get started on a podcast to do with Celtic, we need to assert your Celtic credentials. <laughs> so the first question is, what was your first Celtic game? Who was your first Celtic hero? Ah, well, my first Celtic game was against St Mirren in 1977. My recollection of it is rather vague because I was five years of age. Um, however, I do remember being there. I have a recollection of being there. Um, and I suppose it was probably the first time I was in such a big crowd. And, uh, of course, that whole experience and atmosphere, particularly as a child, you have of the the the, um, the magnitude of people and a wholly different environment from the wee boy from a street in Yoker um, who may or may not have been at primary school by that time. I can't quite remember. But I do remember my first game. And I do know... Not because I remember, but I do know we beat 2 1, and it was two own goals. <laughs> <laughs> you say the very remember. 
I can to this day, if I smell a certain, and, and it becomes less frequent, a certain type of pipe smoke, it transports me back to my first ever Celtic game because the guy sitting to my left was smoking a pipe. And my granddad smoked a pipe. But this guy was smoking a pipe outdoors and it was just, it's a different smell, the smoke. And, and those are the sorts of things that... Would you know this, this is odd. The sort of thing that reminds me of my first game is dog racing. Right. Greyhounds. Uh-huh. Because for some reason, in my memory, I associate being at Celtic Park for the first time with Shawfield. Because uh-huh. my dad was a keen uh, follower of greyhound racing. So we would go to Shawfield quite often as a, a young family as well, myself and my younger brother. And actually to this day, every time I see greyhound racing or I pass Shawfield, I associate it with my earliest memories of Celtic. So I suppose we all have that as well. I'm a first hero, and he remained my hero for a long number of years for reasons that would be obvious to any Celtic fan in, in some ways. But very specific to me for one particular reason was Roy Aitken. Because mm-hmm. my first real memory of a Celtic match uh, was when we won the league in 1979. Mm-hmm. It was uh, the 4-2 game against yeah. Rangers. You know the game I'm talking about. One man down, yeah. one goal down. That's what I, That's my first real memory. Um, and, and it's, it's pre- a pretty vivid memory because, of course, not only was it that early memory of being at Celtic Park and everything that goes with being part of the Celtic family and the atmosphere and there with my dad. And I suppose in some ways, that's where I began to really form a, a very close bond with my own father, was mm-hmm. through Celtic, through going to football. It was when we'd time on our own. Then eventually when my younger brother was older, we would go, uh, the three of us, uh, to, to Celtic Park. But that game, uh, for some reason, my memory, my abiding memory um, is, is Roy Aitken, um, and and that uh, infamous four two victory, um, so I do have a vague memory of my first game, but the first real memory I have of Celtic Park um, was winning the league in nineteen seventy nine. Jesus, I realise how long ago that was. <laughs> I, know. I don't always act my age. That's why, and uh, I'm going to realise how long ago that was. And maybe many of your listeners, but in fact, many of your listeners probably were not born then. The reason you really start to feel old when you when you realise that there's people working today who have no recollection of a pre Fergus McCann Celtic, never mind ten men winning winning the league in seventy nine and people like Roy Aiken and some of the people listening to this won't remember. My mates and I used to joke that the Roy Aiken always go in to get a haircut in a hurry and the guy would just chop lumps off. <laughs> right, it, it, it was just all over the place. There was no real <laughs> apart from that bit of a perm, there was no real <coughs> style to it. It was almost as if he just said, just take some chunks off here and there. Right, that's me. I've got 30 seconds for a haircut and I'm out again. Right, exactly. Unusual to most modern day footballers who yeah, do not exactly. run with anything but perfect uh, hairstyles. So the times change in, in, in many ways. Um, but you know, when I think of Roy Aiken, apart from the, you know, the great successes and great title years and great games and, and, and all of the rest of it, it actually just epitomises what my abiding sort of memory of Celtic is that has shaped me as a Celtic fan, and that is the 1980s. You know, mm-hmm. I'm a product of the 1980s because that's when I did yeah. most of my growing up. That was my teenage years. All of all of me is shaped, like any human being, by different experiences, but the 80s define it. And as a Celtic fan, the 80s, the centenary year... Um, and then sadly what came in between, sort of between that period of 1990 and 95 so my, my happiest memory uh, happiest memories of being part of the Celtic family and establishing myself as part of that family is most definitely those years in the 1980s great legends, great managers some great seasons and you know then they were to be repeated latterly yeah. uh, in, in years in the late 90s of course um, and, and I'm having a good season this season this has been a good season so you're talking about the Celtic family so you're from a big Celtic supporting family I am in, in, in an odd way for, for very different reasons uh, my, my mother comes from a, an Irish background my grandparents uh, like many from the Irish community in Scotland and beyond and on this island um, are from Donegal mm-hmm. and it was my Irish grandmother that was the biggest fan which was rather odd for a, a woman born in uh, the, the turn of the century. Yeah. You know, if you think of in, in the 70s, um, a, a, a woman who was in, then in her, her, her 60s, um, but, but being a huge fan of football, more than my grandfather. Me? Right? Yeah, I mean, I, I have many memories as a young child of myself and my cousin sitting in the kitchen, which had a seated area in the, uh, the tenement flat in Yoker, with my gran glued to the radio, 
infamous people like Jimmy Sanderson mm -hmm. uh, at, the, at the broadcasting on Radio Clyde. She was an avid fan of football, an avid fan of Celtic. She just was a wee girl from the deepest rural part of Donegal. Uh, no formal education, like many immigrants to these shores, particularly from the Irish community. Brought up her family in the way she was brought up uh, and developed this love of Celtic. You know, one of the uh, legendary stories in her family is how when they were starting to go on a wee bit in life and my grandfather was earning more money and she would sneak the two youngest kids, my, my mum's uh, younger sisters, up to Celtic Park on a Saturday in the bus when my granda was off to work and he thought she was off to buy them shoes for school <laughs> or whatever the latest story was. She, he thought they were in party shopping and she had to tell the kids on the way home, don't tell your granda about Celtic Park. So, you know, when you think about it, in the seven, six, late 60s, 70s, this... Irish women taking two girls up to Celtic Park. Who unusual? Not unusual today. No. But very unusual, unusual then. then yeah. And then on my father's side, my father doesn't come from a Celtic background in, in any shape or form. Uh, but he's been an avid Celtic fan okay, living in the East End of Glasgow. He comes from Black Hill, as uh, that side of the family do. An avid Celtic fan from ever he remembers. Um, and he, he, he married into an Irish Catholic family from his own very Presbyterian Protestant background. Um, so I, I often say, and this is, is, is defined part of me as a being, that I'm very proud of the fact that my, my mother brought me up in the faith that I still hold today. But my dad, who's not of that faith, he is now, but was not of that faith for most of my childhood and early teenage years, brought me up to be a Celtic fan. I've never confused the two as being the same <laughs> thing. Um, and so I come from a very Celtic family, but for very different reasons. Although it's funny you say never confuse the two. I do remember sneaking out of Mass early one day, and one of the St Vincent de Paul guys at the back having a quite hard to chat, saying that's the reason why Celtic are playing so poorly at the moment. Because so there's too many of you young lads <laughs> who are not staying in Mass till the end. <laughs> and it's all your fault for not... <laughs> For not going to mass, so uh, not everybody's <laughs> able to draw that dividing line between Celtic and uh, and their faith. Well, I, I had to sneak out of mass once time, one time rather, um, for Glasgow Rangers. Uh -huh. and it did not associate. It, it was not associated with, with them playing Celtic. But when I was in my previous job of leading the city council, the Sunday after the UEFA Cup final in Manchester, I was attending the first Holy Communion of one of my closest friends. And life's son at St Joseph's in Mogai. And in my capacity as leader of the City Council, I had to do a live interview with BBC News UK about the circumstances of the UEFA Cup final. And I had to sneak out of mass because it was live at the lunchtime BBC News. And I gave that interview from the gardens of St Joseph's Church from Mogai, which I find somewhat ironic. You know, I would now. have loved you to have said, Thanks for, for taking me out. Just had to sneak out of mass there. And thanks for doing this. <laughs> <laughs> that would have gone down really well. well. You know, but my media team were, of course, uh, ever-present as they are at these things with yeah. politicians. Uh, speaking particularly live, you know, and very sensitive. And we had to reposition the BBC cameraman three times <laughs> so that we didn't have a statue of our lady or a large crucifix behind me as I was speaking about that particular um, match. Well, I'll, I'll get on to, actually... Glasgow's, um, I would almost call it dysfunctional relationship, the city of Glasgow's dysfunctional relationship with its football teams mm, mm. in a minute and the problems that are caused by, well, from my perception, it looks to me that the city doesn't know what to do because it just believes it always has to be balanced. So we can talk about that in a minute. Mm. But before that, we have to get to why you became at Glasgow City Council. So, you talked about your, your Celtic family and things like that. So, were you from a big political family? You talked about being a product of the 80s. Mm. The 80s was a very political time. It was an incredibly political time. And in fact, I think, without straying away from your question, as even politicians in recovery, like uh, I do to this day, um, we're living through a similar time that is as highly politicised as the 1980s was and 
you know, so I'm a product of the 1980s in terms of my politics as well. I come from a very traditional working class Labour family. Um, incidentally, the kind of family that I think Labour has lost over the last uh, decade um, and certainly over the last 12 to 18 months. So, but I was very, uh, they weren't politically active, strong political views and a, a, a loyalty to the Labour Party as, as strong as the loyalty to Celtic. So, you know, I kind of, you know, as much of a, a product of my family making me a Celtic fan, I, I was certainly in my head in my formative years, a Labour supporter as well. But when I went to secondary school in Glasgow, I, I was very active in the Catholic Just, Justice and Peace group in my school, with her then chaplain father, Stephen as well, funnily enough, um, which had a huge influence on my politics. You know, social teaching of the church at that time, the social justice message, when there was unemployment rising uh, unparalleled in, in across this island, uh, 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 since the Second World War, in fact, since the 1930s, there was mm -hmm. a level of unemployment as we watched deindustrialisation wreak havoc in many of our communities in Scotland. Um, the miners' strike, the deployment of the cruise missiles, which became Trident missiles latterly on the Clyde. These were all things that, that our group in school and that generally as a church we were campaigning about these, these social issues. And that had a huge... Um, influence on on my 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 politics uh, at that time, and I, I joined the Labour Party and got very active and particularly active in in what was known as the Benite Tony Ben the Benite campaign group of the party. So I, I was very much in, on 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 the left of the the party, and uh, and of course, who could mention politics in the nineteen eighties and not mention Margaret Thatcher, who became such a divisive figure in the country. Um, so, shaped in the 1980s in terms of politics, joined the Labour Party, got active, um, and it, ultimately my hobby uh, became my job when I went into politics full-time. Your, your comment there, I've, I've got some colleagues who occasionally, you talk about schooling, and uh, they, will, they will talk about, obviously, non-denominational versus Catholic schooling, and ask what the difference is and of course it's difficult to say what the difference is because I didn't go to a non-denominational school so how can I possibly say what the difference is between a non-denominational Catholic school but when I look back with hindsight the, the primary school I went to with the headmistress was a nun and and then secondary school you obviously have that with hindsight I think somebody looking into the education and you would have got similar that we got in the 70s through 80s it would probably be considered quite left wing mm. yeah I think a lot of people who haven't had the experience either of Catholic education or maybe even a particular time in Catholic education in this country um, like the 1980s would be very surprised to know that there was quite a left wing influence in the Catholic education service at that time. Now, I think there was a number of factors for that. Um, whilst the church has got to remain a constant on a number of issues, um, the church is also a church of its time. Mm -hmm. So, like we're seeing with the current pontiff, who is a, perhaps one of the most political with the small P popes we've, we've had in some time, at that, at that time, the 1980s, we were going through a very troubled political time across the world. And the church must reflect that, because if the church is not a church of the people, it's a church of nothing. Yeah, um, but you also got to remember that, that it was also in the background of a generation of school teachers and indeed priests that would have come through the nineteen sixties, the great social liberalisation. Well, of course, they're not going to be untouched by that. And then the radicalisation of the nineteen seventies. There was a political radicalisation in this country of the seventies. It was was probably the, the, the first since maybe the twenties, thirties. Yes, there's been changed political dimensions, but there was a radicalisation in the seventies. And of course, the church had been through its own period of change. The Second Vatican Council, John the Twenty Third, opening the windows, letting fresh air in. So, by the time we were going through a Catholic education in the nineteen eighties, that you had two decades before it, reflected in the teaching and priests that were around at that time. And of course, you have a church reflecting a time uh, that was one of great political trouble. So, yeah, it probably was pretty left. -wing. One of the things that, to this day, I can think, I can still, I can still. I could name the teachers drumming into me how 
wonderful the welfare state, the principle of the welfare mm. state was. Absolutely bash, almost battered over the head about always be thankful that you've got it because it's wonderful. They were the older teachers, so they would have, they would have experienced a world without it. Correct. And, th and these are the things that today we take for granted. We take as a given. Mm -hmm. um, and again, reflecting my own experience in politics and being a particular uh, significant party, certainly at that time, the Labour Party, it was one of the, 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 the things that it was... It's easy to forget when you're in politics or like in any career or in your job, you take past victories as a result that you can maybe live on. We do it as football fans as well. Um, and it, the, the truth is that, like the welfare state, you know, it's a given that we have that now. Um, for the Labour Party, it's a given that you will protect that. And what people expect is, what do you bring us next? Mm -hmm. We do that as football fans as well. Um, we, we, we're it's, looking for what the next expectation is. Like. It's interesting you put it that way and because I sometimes see myself as apolitical. I did, uh, there's a website that, well, you know a bit of my politics as a website. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, have to, do, I, I, have to, I have to confess, <laughs> we've known each other for a wee while. And there's a website called Polit My Political Compass and I went and filled in. And I think there was no political party anywhere. The nearest to me was the SDLP, actually. Mm. So maybe I should go to Northern Ireland and vote. Um, <laughs> but... So sometimes I feel a bit apolitical and I was watching some of the debate in the run up to the election of the mass of Celtic fans on social media talking about voting SNP and those Celtic fans who were loyal to the Labour Party still your point about living on past victories and Correct. not talking about what you're bringing in the future I can remember people then saying but this is the party that brought the welfare state uh -huh, a very long time ago and our expectations are, as you say, that's now a given. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, some people listening to this would say, oh, but we've got to protect it because we could lose it any time. But it's what additional thing are you bringing? And you may also mentioned you can't talk about your political upbringing in the 80s without mentioning Thatcher. Most people under the age of, between the ages of 18 to 30, who could vote, have no recollection of Margaret Thatcher. They weren't even alive. They're, they're lucky people. <laughs> <laughs> but they weren't alive or have no recollection, yet you'll still get Labour fighting mm -hmm. Margaret Thatcher and talking about Margaret Thatcher. It's, it's an irrelevant debate, to some extent, to people under the age of early 30s. Um, so I'll get on to your thoughts, but yeah. those are the two things I'd like to, to come yeah, back to. So we'll, we'll after you being uh, in the Benites... <laughs> well, you, you uh, just like the church... That has to be a church of its time. Politicians have to be of their time as well. And I got elected to Glasgow City Council at the age of 22, just before Labour took power in 1997. And by that time, I had become more pragmatic about my about how you achieve the best form of social democracy um, that, that, that you can. And, 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 and that's what I believe in, a social democracy. Uh, one that, that is equal in opportunity for all and that does redistribute wealth and power. And, you know, I think that it, it goes very much hand in hand uh, with what I believe in as a Christian as, as well. And so I become more pragmatic with my politics. Labour won power in 1997. And, you know, I, I think in those early days there was a, a great record of a government that was radical in its approach, it was fresh in its approach, and it wanted to redistribute wealth and power, and did so. We can debate about how successful it was, about what it failed to do, about where its big achievements were, but as a principle, it did. And that's what we wanted to reflect here in Glasgow and in Glasgow Labour, was what could we do um, in continuing to build on what was beginning to be a story unfolding of a, of a city reinventing itself from the 1980s and the tough times of the 70s before it physically. How could we match social change um, and, and opportunity for the next generation coming out of our, our schools and for those that have been left behind in the 70s and 80s? Um, and, you know, I think we, we, we have a pretty good record in what we did. You can always do more. You look back with hindsight and, 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 and wish there's certain things that, that you'd done better, but... Um, you know, I, I, the word progressive 
has been used a lot in the debate running up to this general election. Um, but that was certainly a term that many of us um, who were on the left of the Labour Party began to describe as, as our journey uh, whilst in government was to, to be progressive. And I think that's an expectation that more than ever uh, people in Scotland uh, are striving towards as we, we we continue to debate what the future so of Scotland is going to be. You, you talk about being in the Bay Nights and becoming more pragmatic or progressive or whatever phraseology. So are you left but pragmatic in terms of, well, I'd rather have some change in power than shout about lots of change and not in power? Or did, as you started to see the pragmatism of, well, you can't do, did your politics move more central or did you stay left? I would say all my instincts are to the left. And I've no problem with saying I'm a socialist and that's where my heart is. But my mind equally says that if I want to apply those socialist ideals, then you have to be pragmatic, just like you have to be in your family life, mm -hmm. just like you have to be about your football club, just like you have to be about your business or your workplace. Um, and the politics is just the same. So I began to realise as I become, as I became more senior at the city's administration here in Glasgow, that you know you have to make choices. You'll have a certain amount to spend. You'll have a certain amount of flexibility, and and you hope and you pray that you make those decisions based on what your um, politics are, what your ethics are, what your principles are, and, and apply them the best way you can. So, yeah, I, I see myself as being on the left, um, but, but, but pragmatic, absolutely pragmatic. My dad puts it a simpler way, and I remember from an early age, he used to always say to me, and I think it really applies now that we have, for the first time in 20 years, got a Conservative uh, government in the UK uh, with a majority he always said when I was growing up, you know, Stephen, a bad Labour government is always better than any Tory government if you're just an ordinary working man. And that those words have always lived with me. It's better to have a government of the centre or centre-left that is pragmatic if you're an ordinary working person than a government of the centre-right who will always, in my view... If they're a government of the centre-right, not necessarily a centrist government, as perhaps you could argue the Liberal Conservative coalition was, but when you have a government of the centre-right, they will not consider the principle of redistribution of wealth and power. They will not consider the interests of labour over capital. It's always capital before labour. And for me, I instinctively, in everything I do, everything I did in politics, and I like to think... and. People that work with me may judge otherwise, but in my employment now in the private sector, um, and those that work with me, um, the, the, the core of our business is putting the interests of labour, the labour of the business, including my own, my own as the, the leader of my consultancy uh, uh, business, um, we put the interests of us all at the heart of it and not just the interests of the, the bottom line of the company. So, talk about the <coughs> 80s. Growing up in the 80s, Glasgow was... Uh, older gent maybe they weren't old they just seemed older <laughs> people like Pat Lally and Charlie Gordon and Michael Kelly and then all of a sudden it was almost overnight there was people like yourself and, and others a, a sort of a younger breed how did that change happen? All we represented in the late 90s and early turn of the, 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 the century is we just represented the change that was happening in Glasgow. Glasgow was changing. Mm -hmm. Younger people were staying in Glasgow. They didn't have to leave the city to find employment. Why? Because people like Pat Lally and Michael Kelly, not that Michael would thank you for being put in the same <laughs> sentence as Pat, I have to say. Both of them are friends of mine, I, ha I, I, I must point out, but Michael certainly wouldn't thank you for them. But anyway, um, but because of much that had been done before, our generation of Labour politicians... Um, uh, in, it, it were given the privilege of the reins of, of power and direction for a while. Because of the building blocks that have been put in place, I think a more youthful generation with maybe a different style of politics and, and, and maybe a bit more pragmatic than Labour leaders of the city in the past were able to flourish because we were just reflecting a more vibrant Glasgow. We were just reflecting a younger Glasgow and maybe a Glasgow that was punching above its weight a little. 
um, and and I, and I think that's 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 a kind of narrative of of what happened to that team, and it was exciting things because Glasgow was as it still is, but Glasgow changed dramatically and very quickly over a 10, 15 year period from the mid nineteen nineties to to the recession hit, and everybody got stuck a little again. Um, just at that 2008-2009 period. So what was your proudest achievement in charge of Glasgow? Undoubtedly winning the Commonwealth Games for Glasgow and Scotland. I didn't win them, but I had the privilege of being part of the front house team and being the lead person from the city's perspective. We had a fantastic team of people. We worked hand in hand with the Scottish Government uh, with Jack McConnell originally as First Minister and then with great pragmatism despite um, political differences of the time with Alex Salmond um, and, uh, uh, but more importantly the people, the real people of the bid were the people that put together what the sports programme would be the people that put together the cultural programme that would that would run at the same time and I think we all agree it was a great festival yeah. not just of sport in Glasgow um, the people that put how the transport infrastructure would work together the people that put together how the the, the, um, the, the, the whole operation would work in a physical sense and in, in terms of the, the things you had to think about but where people stay the hotels would the restaurants be right yeah, everything, the whole package just as if you were inviting someone to a big family celebration in your own home, you would think about, you know, what's the starter, what's the main course, what's the dessert, about what, what we're offering them a nice drink, or is it a nice day, we're going to be in the garden, all the logistics. You know, we put together a darn good package. I was incredibly privileged because all I was was the front house man. Mm -hmm. I had this big team behind me that were delivering the real thing, and I just had to front it up. Um... But to be part of that team, we were a very small but close knit team. To be part of that team was a privilege I will never. I can forget. I can remember sending your text because I was coming down from East Kilbride and they were on the radio and it was about to go to the announcement and there was a rainbow across. Glasgow. Yeah, I remember when I was in Sri Lanka at the time. And you were in yes. Sri Lanka and there was the rainbow was landing in Celtic Park from mm. where I was coming down and near where Lord Hockey's replica of the White House is being built at the moment. Um, if anybody knows the area, I was driving down there and just looked across and I thought, oh, we're going to win this. We're going to win this. <laughs> there, was, there was an early sign. There's a sign. There was There's an a early sign. And it goes into Celtic Park. It couldn't <laughs> even be, couldn't even be uh, better. Because and what a sense. fabulous night the opening ceremony at Celtic Park was. It was everything that as a bid team we dreamed it would be. And, you know, it must have made every Celtic fan proud to see the stadium used for that purpose, for the world's eyes to be upon it and indeed you know I, I made every Scot proud I think we as a city made our nation so proud during that uh, fantastic uh, Commonwealth Games that festival of fun that everybody felt part of and there was a wee bit of divine intervention because when did Glasgow last oh, have no. such a great start to the Glasgow <laughs> well, Fair with the weather we had in that first week of the Games you couldn't have asked for no more. you couldn't um, so a proud moment is there any sadness that you weren't part of it? Oh, it would be human nature, not. Of course, you know. Look, time. Politicians are transient. And I've had a lot of time since I resigned from office five years ago to think about the fifteen years I spent in full time politics and uh, the the twenty three years that I spent active in politics. Politicians are transient. And that's the truth. And that applies to David Cameron, as it applied to Alex Salmond, although he's reinventing himself again in Westminster with much interest. Um, as it applied to Tony Blair and everybody else. And at a wee local level here in Glasgow, the same applies. You mentioned the figures of the 80s, like Pat Lally and Michael Kelly. I would also add Gene McFadden, who goes unnoticed, but was a very quiet and astute leader of the city for a, a number of years. And, you know, I... I, I um, was just happy to be part of the celebration in Glasgow. I knew I played a wee part in it, like everyone, but part of the reason, a significant part of the reason that we won the bid as significantly as we did in Sri Lanka is an early decision was taken not to have Glasgow councillors and other politicians and our ambassadors of the bid from the world of sport, culture and everywhere else travelling the world promoting the city. We put a greater emphasis on bringing the voting delegations of the 71 nations and territories and islands of the Commonwealth to Glasgow mm -hmm. in the two years 
uh, leading up to that victory in Sri Lanka in uh, December, November, December 2007. We brought them here. Um, so everybody played their role in winning the games for Glasgow because it was the experience that those delegates had when they came and spent a week in Glasgow. Yes, they had a beautiful dinner in the city chambers. Yes, they had a wonderful tour of the sports facilities we have, the cultural facilities we have, the wonderful public parks we have. But they met the people of Glasgow, the people that served them in restaurants, the people that were the hotel staff, the cab drivers of the city. The, you know, they, they went and experienced the wonderful shopping. You know, and you got all those countless stories that you hear in Glasgow all, all the time that visitors mm -hmm. to a city tell us, you know, you ask for direction, but somebody doesn't they just give you directions. They take you there or they start pointing you out. You know, all of that. That, Glasgow sold itself. One of my disappointments, actually, I remember saying this to a mutual friend of ours, that the real challenge for me, for Glasgow, was grabbing that feel-good mood that wandering around the streets of Glasgow, I hadn't felt like that since 88, 90, you know, the, mm. around mm -hmm. that time. Keeping that, po it's, it's impossible to keep it, that level of momentum going, but, keep, but take some of that and use it to drive Glasgow forward. You know, I used the stat that Glasgow was 65th in 2013 for job creation in the UK. And my disappointment as a Glaswegian is that I think we didn't do that. There's been no rule on positive positivity from that. One of the frustrations I always had when I was serving in politics in the city is that I think that as a city and as a city council, for a long time we have always been very good at staging the big events. And you're right to talk about 1988, the Garden Festival, 1990, the Year of Culture, 2014, the Commonwealth Games, and all these other events we've had, you know, European uh, Cup Finals mm -hmm. in, in the city and, and big concerts and what the Hydro's doing. And, you know, we get lots of that right and do it really well. And we have changed the image of the city. Um, as importantly, it, it, its image in other with other parts of the United Kingdom, mm -hmm. as well as internationally. Um, but do we capitalise enough on, on, on that feel-good factor? And, and, and uh, you know, I still don't think we've got that bit right. I, I agree. Um, just like it took us a long time, I think, to get better in terms of the public services we ran. Because, mm -hmm. again, we can be good at the, the big stuff. We can create the Kelvin Grove Art Gallery. We can refurbish it. We can attract the one million visitors. Um, but did we, did we always give... Um, the, the, you know, the, the, the customer at the service point in the housing department, the best service, or the customer at the service point when they were in the library, the best service. Mm -hmm. We're always good at that. Better at it, yes. And the same with, do we capitalise enough on the big events? No. Do we capitalise enough on the old firm and the great institutions they are in the city? Probably not. So I think the challenge for the next decade in this city, um, there's probably a number of challenges, but one of them certainly is, what's the next big idea for Glasgow? Um, and how do we get better at capitalising on these big ideas and maintaining them so that we don't just need a big idea every five or seven years that keeps a feel-good factor? It's not hard to keep a feel-good factor in Glasgow because Glaswegians are friendly and they're naturally optimistic and we do make the best of bad times. You know, we're a resilient race. And we are a race. Glaswegians are a race of people and interesting, very... We're, we're not like the rest of Scotland, are we? We, we aren't. We, we, sta <laughs> we stand differently. And that's hot funny. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so I, I can that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you touch on something there, which is one of my, uh, sorry, probably bees in the bonnet that I've, I've got just now, which is a criticism of football. I asked people, I, I wrote to the SFE and various other people, how much benefit does football generate? for the wider economy mm. uh, in the industry that I work in I know all the stats about how many full time jobs are created so every one house in the UK uh, generates £2.64 jobs every £1 spent in construction generates £2.84 of benefit to the GDP I ask those questions of football and they say we don't know mm. well how can you lobby on behalf of mm -hmm. football but what I was able to find was a report by Strathclyde University done in 2004 yes which I've index linked up, done a bit of back of a fag packet taken into account. This was only Celtic and Rangers they analysed. Yep. The Scotland games, there's cup finals, mm -hmm. cup semi finals, and there's Thistle and Celtic and Rangers attendances are down a bit. Yep. 
equating all that up, Celtic, the existence of football in Glasgow generates approximately £70 million pounds mm-hmm. a year to the city. Mm-hmm. But I always get the impression the city's a bit embarrassed. The city doesn't know what to do with its relationship with the old firm. And it's a difficult one for politicians because it's easy to put a foot wrong and to, um, you know, have the... the um, you know, we live in a village in Scotland mm-hmm. and Glasgow's a bit of a hamlet. And it's easy to put a foot wrong and you have, you know, the city's journalists on your back. You have one side or both sides of the old firm's fans on your back and then you have your peer group on your back because you, know, you may have just wandered into what is... There's this broad brush term called sectarianism mm-hmm. um, and you've wandered into a minefield and for politicians that don't get the old firm particularly if they're not football fans it's very very easy to, to make a slip that you simply don't mean and I think primarily for that reason the city in itself um, and, and this would probably apply, uh, apply to the large corporates in the city as well it don't know how to have a proper relationship with the old firm which you don't see replicated when you go to cities like Manchester. No. You know, the relationship between the two big clubs and Manchester is, you know, it's it's visible mm-hmm. um, and it's very defined and they're very much part of the city's current narrative as opposed to a kind of sideline narrative that we mm-hmm. have. Yeah. So, you know, we have this narrative about the old firm in Glasgow, some of which is true um, and, and some of which is not and where they kind of sit as a kind of side story, but you know, the old firm, the the, 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 the old firm derby is the you know, it's the it's the, it's the worst derby in the world, you know. You know, it's like a, you know, the way Sky build it up before a, a, a Celtic and Rangers match, and and, and, and the, the whole atmosphere is a bit different. It shouldn't be for a number of reasons. One, think of the century we live in, think of how comfortable we we have are as a city with ourselves as an identity think of how socially liberal we are as a city now, think of how much we understand about each other's cultural backgrounds, people are much more comfortable in their own skin than ever I remember, certainly when I was growing up um, being defined in terms of faith or colour or any of these things was was a pretty significant mm-hmm. definition, yeah. I, I don't think that's true now of, of the world, never mind at Glasgow so we should be more comfortable with the relationship with the firm. And you make a very important point. I remember that study that was published by the University of Strathclyde in 2004. It made for very interesting reading. And I can't remember if published, but certainly part of that study was a... Because I read the study, um, was a specific look at what European knights alone mm-hmm. bring to the city of Glasgow, no matter whether it's Celtic or Rangers playing. And one European home match alone, I can't remember the exact figure, um, brings in excess of a million pounds. I think it was a million to three million pounds, depending on, in that night, to the mm-hmm. city in economic value. So if this, if the old firm were just simply two big private sector companies, yeah, bringing that gross value added, what did you say, 70 million uh-huh. per annum? Yeah. Would be all over them. That's Politicians would be everything. They'd be at the front of the queue to have their photograph taken. So we do undervalue both sides of the old firm in terms of Celtic and Rangers. What they contribute positively to this city, economically, culturally and socially. Because the impression, it's interesting you say Manchester. Because the impression I've, gotten, I've got, and I've spoken, with, I've spoken with people at Celtic, that if Manchester City go and say to Manchester City Council, we want to do X, Y, Z, and we want your help. Well, they've asked for it. They generate X income, so they help them. The impression I get is that Glasgow then turn around and say, can you just wait? Because we can't do anything for you unless they're doing it. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Manchester, I think also there's a... Maybe it's more with with some elements of the support. There's a pettiness to you can't go... the, um, The state aid... Yes. Stuff that, man, that Glasgow's going through just now on the accusation that they've assisted yes. Celtic. That I, I, I don't think Manchester United, in the example I give, would be petty enough to say, wait a minute, you need to help us. Because I imagine Manchester, Manchester City Council would turn around and say, well, you come up with an equally compelling economic and financial argument as to why we should help you, we will. 
because each argument will be taken in its own merit, whereas I guess just get the impression we as a city will never do something for one unless the other one is doing the exact same project and then there'll be an assistance. Yeah, I think I think that is true to, to, to an extent. Glasgow is one of these cities where he who shouts loudest mm-hmm. always gets heard. In fact, we're all going to shout a wee bit in Glasgow. It's, it's part of our nature, you know, in the workplace, in the workplace canteens, you know, the, the, in the union branch meetings, in the pub. He who shouts loudest can easily dominate, or she. And uh, that, that sometimes happens with the city's relationship with the old firm, is that a small section of fans on either side will shout loudly through paranoia mm-hmm. or whatever about a perception that, in some way, the city or somebody else is giving an advantage. And I, I, I use two examples that I was involved in. You, you've mentioned one. There was a section of Rangers fans um, who thought that by doing what we were doing for the Commonwealth Games, it was somehow some kind of added benefit um, to, to Celtic. Well, of course there was a spin-off benefit to Celtic. And why shouldn't there be? They're a major institution of the city. Mm-hmm. That's the same reason I backed Rangers bid to be the location for the Super Casino, which would have brought a hundred million regeneration to Ibrox. The casino would have been a small part of a huge regeneration project that would have brought jobs, um, it would have brought a whole number of leisure and retail activities for mm-hmm. children and families, not just about gambling, if you have a specific view on gambling, I understand that, but the, 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 uh, you know, a hundred million pounds was when it kicked up half a billion pound of regeneration across Governor and Ibrox, would Rangers have had a spin-off benefit? Yes, they would have, and why not? Mm-hmm. Why shouldn't any of the big uh, institutions, corporates, the council, anyone that's contributing to the economic growth of our city and therefore the social well-being of people that live in the city, why shouldn't they have a spin-off benefit from big projects, particularly big infrastructure projects? And again, you know, when I was supporting that bid for the casino... You had a section of Celtic fans saying, what's he doing assisting and helping Rangers Football Club? They shout loud, but I don't actually think that either of those examples represent the majority mm-hmm. of mainstream, sensible, open-minded people who can see the bigger picture. That when the city puts its weight behind doing something big in terms of regeneration, if in this case it happens that one of our football clubs benefit as a result by an enhanced environment or whatever, and this is only good for the general well-being of the whole city. Um, and equally, I go back to the point earlier, the city should get more comfortable about its relationship with the old firm. Both sides of the old firm are a huge asset to the city, and we don't exploit that asset for the benefit of our economy this, enough. This sort of kickstarter for the bee in the bonnet for me just now is I was at something earlier this year, and there was a report by Glasgow City Council. They had a stand at this thing I was at. And then there, there, there was a report about the city centre. And I'm reading it, and... I'm having a laugh with my colleague because it's always sunny in Glasgow. Everybody's young and everybody's happy. That was all the, the pictures they had in it. <laughs> but I started to notice it's it's talking about everywhere that generates money for the city. Um, IT and um, everything you could... Tourism. Every, every area of the economy you could think of was mentioned about how much money it generates. Except football. And then they have this red dotted line around the city centre so it goes up the the past from the Kingston Bridge across around the M8 down High Street round the Clyde that's our core city centre that sort of square mile and a half whatever it is that's the core city centre and that's if we get things right in there that will drive Mm. the economy and get all that then they have this wee red dotted line which goes out loops around the Emirates and comes back in again so I'm thinking to myself they're not saying this is peculiar to only the city centre. They are, they're because they're including the Emirates Arena. So I had the name of the person who wrote the report, so I, ph- I phoned them up. Had a laugh and a conversation with them about the always sunny and everybody's happy in Glasgow. And then I say, why have you not mentioned football? Well, that would be in a different type of report. That very phrase yeah. summed up to me the attitude of someone who's behind that report. But that's obviously part of the culture. That would be a different type of report. Well, what do you mean? Well, when went more? And I said, well, you ring fence the Emirates, which takes about 3,000 seats, right across the road to a 60,000 seat arena, which is filled, or two th- two thirds full, 22 times a year. Well, if all you're on here is just to make a petty point about football, there's no point in having a conversation in Hanover. Well, that's... But that, to me, yeah. summed up the, it's a cultural attitude 
it seems to me within the city itself of foot, well we'd ring fence football and put it in a completely we wouldn't want to include it in the nice friendly stuff where people are smiling in the sunshine yes yeah that that's what it feels like as a football fan I think that's pretty accurate I have to say and I mentioned earlier Manchester's relationship and approach is entirely different and I think it's right to look at Manchester because they are probably the most comparable city region for Glasgow to compare itself with mm-hmm. on this island and they're also one of our nearest competitors in, in terms of of, of where the, the, the city's economic regeneration has been and is going and you know they just you just wouldn't have that the, the two clubs are very much at the heart of the economic strategy of the city of Manchester if you pick up the same report in Manchester I'll bet you see the stadiums and the clubs and their fans in that report you know and why shouldn't we what emphasised even more? Maybe was, I should have done more when I was in Well, what em- well that's a question I'll go into because one of the things they emphasised, they didn't mention Celtic Rangers as they mentioned the European Cup final being mm. held in Glasgow and the UEFA Cup final being held in Glasgow. So I actually mentioned them and then not mention the Indigenous teams. It gets back to a point you just made a wee moment ago. Why do we not, or why did we not, really promote and sell the Celtic Rangers game? Um, when it existed, of this is a wonderful carnival of football. It's got a fierce rivalry with historic roots to it. Not not to ignore the sectarian issue, but the va- as you pointed out, the vast majority of people who go to these games are not. Yes, there are some vile songs sung, but the vast majority of individuals sit side by side with the supporter of the other team every day of the week at yeah. work. Which then leaves the door open to people referring to. So when I was talking to a stranger last week about the Celtic Rangers game and and, and uh, my disappointment in the past, Glasgow didn't make more of it. It's because of your sectarian problem. Mm. By continually ignoring it, you re-emphasise a problem which you and I would agree is much less than it was Absolutely. when we were growing up. Much less. What happens is perception, like lots of things in life, perception becomes reality. And I absolutely agree with you. If we don't find a way of celebrating the contribution of the old firm, and actually celebrating the build-up to the fierce rivalry that an old firm derby brings to Mm -hmm. the city, where everybody kind of gets involved to a greater or lesser degree, even people that aren't hugely motivated by football in itself, if we don't celebrate it in a better way, then what we allow to happen is the build-up to be a message around safety, a warning from the police yeah. about you know how people behave, about whether people will drink too much, whether it be domestic violence. Now, I'm not downplaying any of these issues. It's really important those issues are addressed. Mm-hmm. But if they become the sole narrative, just using the build-up to an old firm match um, as an example, if they become the sole narrative, then the perception becomes, well, that's not a safe day in the city of Glasgow. Mm -hmm. When the reality is, it's one of the safest days because the police police these things very well. The vast majority of fans, the vast vast majority of fans are extremely well behaved, perhaps a wee bit more well behaved on that day because you you are being more careful. Um, And and you're right, you know, people work side by side, people have families where they have mixed support, people go back to, you know, pubs, restaurants, you know, the golf club, the bowling club, whatever, and the fans mix after the match as well. Um, but overall, the narrative of what we do around the old firm um, as a city isn't right yet. Of, of that, I have no doubt. But the side issue connected with it, which I would, you know, you, you mentioned the, the unfortunate element of um, domestic abuse, and, and I would always argue someone who beats their wife beats their wife. Alcohol and other factors are trigger mechanisms. Correct. It's not football's fault. That that guy's a wife beater. That guy's a wife beater. Yeah. Um, equally, I get quite irked by the laying secta- the sectarian issue of Scotland being laid wholly at the door of Celtic and Rangers, almost as if if we put it at the door of dirty down market football, the rest of us can carry on with our lives knowing that it's not our fault. Mm. And so, as part of that, I know you and I have had this discussion before connected to the football and the sectarian issue one of the other things that people would say you said you could have done more about football is it within the remit 
of local politicians to move it away from a personal question <laughs> to deal with things like the volume of orange walks in Scotland, which contribute to the sectarian issue. Can politicians do anything about that side of Scotland? Well, if you have dialogue, you, of course you can always do something about it, and that's been proven um, with a, a more mature relationship in recent years between the Orange Order and Glasgow City Council, where the number of processions have, has been reduced quite dramatically. There's been a different approach to how uh, Orange Order parades um, are policed. In fact, there's a lot more self-policing by the Order. So it would be wrong not to give the Orange Order some credit for <laughs> being prepared to enter that dialogue. Because when I was in office and first tried to have a dialogue with them about it, it was a closed door and there was very closed minds. And that would probably apply to local politicians as well, who would either want to shy away from the issue or would have a very closed mind about how you tackle it. And my deputy leader at the council at the time, Councillor Jim Coleman, decided to tackle it head on and say, no, it's not acceptable um, at the number of uh, orange parades that there are in this city. Uh, they were higher at that time than the city of Belfast. Mm -hmm. And when he came to me when I was in office and I said, look, I want to do something about this. Um, and if the Orange Order won't engage with us, then you know I'm going to do something about this. It's in, it was in his particular uh, cabinet remit. And I said yes. And he did. And the number of processions has been reduced. So local politicians have a lot more power than sometimes they themselves realise. Um, but it's but we, we change these things by dialogue. Mm -hmm. you, know, you started off the question of the general issue, this catch-all, and it becomes a catch-all about yeah. sectarianism that's laid solely at the, the, the door, often mainly by the media, but m often by politicians, local and national, at the door of the old firm. In my experience, working in the private sector, in my experience in my school years, in my experience as a politician, holding the highest public office in my home city, sectarianism, as we understand it, and we can all define it slightly differently, is actually, it does still exist. Not to the level that some in the media would have us believe, but in my experience, it exists more in some of the closed minds of people who work in significant parts of the private sector. There are still legal firms in parts of Scotland, it's not just in Glasgow as well, incidentally. Actually, I think the further you go from Glasgow, in my experience as well, the more um, closed minds you have, shall we say, maybe rather than sectarianism, uh, about about people's views of folk from a different cultural background. So I think there were, the legal world was still a wee bit in some of our practices, not the practices, but I mean mm -hmm. in some of the firms, uh, to catch up with a more inclusive society. I mean, I pick on the legal firms, I could pick on others, but I just say my experience... I think there are other parts of uh, Scotland's uh, PLC's life that maybe have to catch up with the world we live in that's much more tolerant, understanding, inclusive, comfortable in its own skin than the firm do. Both clubs do an incredible amount to tackle um, some of the past problems uh, that have been associated with the, 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 the um, clash that can happen when there are people from different cultural backgrounds following the club you mentioned and they don't get enough credit for it at times you mentioned the catch-all no and, and, and I think that's as I say my, my big bugbear is that sometimes I think it's too easy for everybody to package it up and say let's all just blame Celtic and Rangers mm -hmm. and because then you can then you can pretend that it's a Saturday issue but equally there are people who come along and just blame Catholic schools mm -hmm. now, it, it, it's less than it used to be but I remember when I first got elected to the council in 1990 Five, um, twenty years ago, it, it, you know, sectarianism popped up within a year on the agenda of the city. You know, almost as if you know, there's yet another article in the Herald, and it's about sectarianism. It's on the front page. What's the council got to say? What's Celtic got to say? What Rangers got to say? And a colleague of mine, a very, who became a very close friend, a very wise uh, older woman who'd been in politics for a long time, and who herself was not from a Catholic background, and it says to me. Do you know, Stephen, as soon as this comes up, I've watched this for 25 years in politics. See, tomorrow, Catholic schools will get the blame of this. Now, she herself wasn't Catholic. She didn't have an axe to grind. Her family didn't go to Catholic schools. So, you know, it, 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 it trundles along from being the old firm to people simply saying then it's Orange Parades or simply saying it's Catholic schools. It's not. If people... Um, if people are going to take a sectarian view 
I, I just see that as people are taking a closed mind view. They're not open to working or judging people as individual human beings. And most importantly, we're all judged by our actions and how we behave. That doesn't mean that none of us can make mistakes. I've certainly made mine. Um, but the greatest heroes of mine in life are those that have faced their mistakes, got back up on their horse and got on with their life and learned from them. And when we understand that as a concept, anyway, and I don't mean as a society, because I think society does understand mm -hmm. that, otherwise society would not have evolved in the way it has over the centuries. When we as individuals at some point in our journey in life understand that, then what room is there for any of us to be sectarian about anything? You said the catch-all of sectarianism. The other thing I can remember is you and I having a conversation about uh, me saying to you, there must be something you could do about the uh, orange order and blah, 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 blah. I remember you saying that the problem, it has to be dialogue with people. Because the problem when you start legislating and what you proceeded to describe, you might not remember this, what you proceeded to describe is the mess the SNP have got themselves in over the events of behaviour mm -hmm. acting. Mm -hmm. Because your point was what then becomes your definition and my definition of sectarian starts to then blur the edges and starts to become, we didn't use the word offensive, but yeah. it's the mess they've made of the offensive behaviour at Football Act. They certainly have, and I, I think, I hope they've learned from them. I have a huge respect for much of what the SNP government have done and what they may yet indeed still achieve. It would be churlish to say anything other than that they are the great success story of this century and people will be writing their dissertations about it in terms of politics of the turn of this century for some time. But to take uh, that specific issue of the Offensive Behaviour Act, that is exactly the example I was speaking about prior to that ever being the agenda when we had that conversation about if you take a top-down approach to issues like that, then you'll get the wrong result. Because somebody will draft legislation um, as I think they did in this case, saying, oh, we're going to be careful about who we die, who the dialogue's with, because there's going to be a balance, there's going to be this, da 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 One of the great things about devolution that I found, um, almost from the earliest days of having our own parliament here in Scotland, is that it is beautiful to be small. Mm -hmm. And I didn't mind when Jack McConnell had we are the best wee small country in the world, or whatever it was, but it, you know, a lot of people knocked it. But one of the beauties of small government and small governance, and being in a small country, is it's much easier, first of all, to know your politicians, to have access to those who legislate, um, and to influence them, and to have a dialogue. So, when you're in a small country, and you have a devolved parliament like we do, actually the people that can affect change in politics, sometimes, are not politicians but those who can create change from beneath politicians and carry politicians with them. And if, for example, you had taken the government or anyone else had taken a different approach to how you deal with offensive behaviour, nobody wants offensive behaviour at football. Yeah. And of course we have to, you know, we're a civilised society. You have to have demarcation. Um, but in fact, if that had been drawn up and influenced by people who go to football matches, who have experienced offensive behaviour, um, who are worried about their kids that are there, by those who teach in our schools because you know, schools have a role and how we influence our, our young people, by the clubs them, themselves. If, in fact, it had been something that was organic from mm -hmm. those that it directly affected, um, we'd have a much better piece of legislation. In fact, maybe we wouldn't have needed legislation. We, maybe we would have just needed our police and our judiciary um, to apply existing legislation appropriately. And I think the, the difficulty with, there's a number of difficulties with this piece of legislation, but it's certainly one of the difficulties I see from looking, I don't have direct experience, but looking from the outside, is the, the, the manner in which perhaps it is, being, it is being enforced by the police. Well, I'll, I'll move on off that, on to, we touched on your political background. So, and you mentioned uh, people will be writing dissertations about the SNP. People might also be writing dissertations about the end of the Labour Party in Scotland. No. <laughs> uh, I, I feel like I'm writing a, <laughs> a, 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 a modern studies question here. The Labour Party in Scotland discuss. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you see has gone wrong for the Labour... Well, the Labour Party UK-wide, 
and the Labour Party in Scotland. Because as a as an apolitical person sometimes, I see looks like it might be difficult for the Labour Party to be the Labour Party that wins in England and the Labour Party that wins in Scotland. Yeah, well, the, the Labour Party, for me, if you take the Labour Party across the United Kingdom, it has five very significant challenges, in my view. There's Scotland. Mm -hmm. And what post-devolved Scotland means for Labour in Scotland. And that in itself is a huge topic. And, and, and you know, it's a plain fact to say it's went incredibly wrong for Labour. Yeah. Without any shadow of a doubt. The second problem is, and this is a problem that's been long-standing, which is why New Labour was created, is that when you go south of the border, you then have the challenge of winning enough votes in England to form a government, which means you have to appeal to the southeast of England and actually to the same class, I still talk about class politics because I think it still applies, to working class, we call them aspirational now, we have, new, we, you know, we have new titles, nothing's really new. Skilled working class, aspirational working class, people who work for a living, whatever you want to describe them, in the south of England began to vote Tory in the 1980s, and Tony Blair had to win them back in ninety seven with the creation of New Labour. That still applies. And that's the second problem for the UK Labour Party, is how do you build that coalition of your core vote, north of Watford, and everything in the south-east of England, in order to be the biggest party, and hopefully a majority party. That's the second challenge for the Labour Party. The third challenge is that their core vote has disappeared and has changed dramatically since the 1970s, because that core vote from 1945 to the late 70s, which was around the industrial mass organised mm -hmm. working classes in traditional industry, heavy industry, engineering, manufacturing, that the shop stewards could line up the day before polling day in the thousands and say, you know, vote for Harry Brady tomorrow, he's a good labour man, he's a good trade unionist, that organisational tool went. Mm -hmm. um, and people's perceptions of cloth cap means I vote Labour as well change so that the, the core vote has slowly been disappearing and that core vote has aged and, st and that ageing mm -hmm. core vote that yeah. is from the industrial past is still, the, is still there, certainly south of the border I think some of it north of the border has went to the SNP as well but so that industrial organised working class um, has gone and, and, and have been replaced by people who go to work sometimes in a call centre or a shirt and tie who maybe wouldn't consider themselves working class because they don't work in a shipyard. Mm -hmm. you know, whole change dynamic there. The fourth problem is that of that northern, northern, north of Watford, as I would describe it, core traditional Labour vote in England, that part of England, as your friend from Hull, who we've discussed before, says that England's going further to the left, is. Mm -hmm. And you've seen that with the results. In, in, in the May general election and that left vote was going to the Greens or predominantly to UKIP ironically yep. in Northern England so that's the fourth challenge uh, for, for, for uh, Labour and I think the fifth challenge for Labour and it, it, it's, it's particularly acute for Labour across the United Kingdom just now but it applies to all political parties this is not just the Labour Party there are some exceptions in each party but Politics, modern politics, for lots of different reasons, does not seem to attract the big historical intellectual heavyweights mm -hmm. that people say, you know, oh, he's different. He commands respect across the spectrum. She's really different. She's broken through a ceiling, you know, man, woman, whoever it was. And I think, and sadly, it's, it's men in the main, not entirely, that I think of when I think of how that's changed for Labour in Scotland. So those political giants of Robin Cook, John Smith, Gordon Brown, John Hume Robertson, Donald Dewar, Dennis Canavan. Where are those people that yeah. you're up Or is it just that me, despite being in my early 40s, doesn't make me too old, I hope, that is it just me politically and looking back with rose-tinted glasses and it was all wonderful in the heyday? Or has politics across our island, and I think across party, in my view, lost that kind of parliamentarian, that kind of, I can only describe it as that intellectual heavyweight, because it included you know, the back benches in, in, in Westminster I think is particularly depressing, the back benches of both sides of the chamber used to include people at 
that frankly didn't they want to be a minister. So you had real parliamentarians mm -hmm. holding the executive to account, holding their own front bench to account as well. So I think that is the five big challenges facing Labour um, across the United Kingdom. They're all significant. Some of those challenges are faced by other parties as well, but you know, my historical party has, without a doubt, the most significant challenges, and its biggest challenge lies here in Scotland, ironically, by the thing it gave birth to, devolution. One of my perceptions in looking at the downfall of Scotland is, and it was actually reading something about South Africa that made me think this way, there was, um, it was when they were in the last month or so when they've been taking down it was just before the election I thought of this they were taking down the, the statues in South Africa of some of the, the whites who'd formed the university but had also been a, a main factor in apartheid and there was some worrying uh, whilst the, the people at the core of it were, were, were doing doing good there was some worrying people on the periphery that, that made, you, made you think of what's happened in Zimbabwe hmm. And I thought, is that a legacy of, for centuries, whenever we can get majority rule, things will be all right. And after 20 years, Nirvana hasn't arrived. Mm -hmm. And made me think about the Labour Party that during the 80s and 90s, that Th Mrs Thatcher from the south of England concept mm -hmm. has ruined Scotland. And once we get Labour back in, everything we put back to the way it was. There's a part of me wonders whether the fact that Scotland didn't go back to the way it was after Labour came in in 97 started a disaffection, which then accelerated with devolution when Labour sent its, what was left of the big hitters, down to Westminster and the SNP withdrew its big hitters back up to Scotland. So the politicians talking in Scotland of any clout were in the SNP ranks. But the two things together had an impact. Yeah, I, I think the two things together probably did have an impact. And as ever, politics is about people. So, I mean, you know, we can overanalyse these things or you can underanalyse them because, you know, it's, it's quite complex. But overall, to understand the complexity of politics and to, to be in touch, because you have to be in touch in order to be in power, with people, things have to be quite simple. Because the vast majority of people, in my experience, don't take the level of interest in politics that you and I do. It doesn't make them any less political. Mm -hmm. They don't take the level of interest and make the level of analysis that we do. In fact, often they kind of make their mind up firmly about how they're voting, if they're voting at all, although we do vote in larger numbers in Scotland than we have in some time. They often make it up over the dinner table or when the kids are going to bed or you know, maybe a few days or a week before the election firmly be swaying towards it. So you have to keep it simple. Now, I would describe it as this is just how simplistic the fall of Labour and the acute position it's in now has happened. In the 1970s, highly politicised, radicalised country in different ways and, and, and not radicalised in one direction, in Scotland, the SNP make a break breakthrough in 1974 with 11 MPs. Oil is found. And for, for the first time since the 50s, when there was a strong Scottish Unionist Party, later to be the Scottish Conservative Party, um, Labour has a challenge on its hands. And the great thinkers of that time that then shaped the Labour Party from the mid-70s to the late 90s of Donald Dewar and Helen Liddell and George Robertson and Gordon Brown and John Smith said we have to be the party of home rule again. And that became reinforced during the Thatcher years where people in middle class, middle ground, centre ground Scotland felt very disenfranchised from the policies of Margaret Thatcher, felt uncomfortable with them, which she sealed with her infamous Sermon on the Mound. Mm -hmm. And the nearest thing we had to Parliament was the Kirk. Yeah. It was the General Assembly was whether people feel comfortable with that or not. And for went, oh no. So Home Rule, and it was very simply put across by statesmen like Donald Dewar, vote for us, we're Scotland's party, we will protect you from these big bad Tories in London. And as you rightly said, there was this kind of, as we can be quite romantic, although we're a very sophisticated nation when it comes to our politics as mm -hmm. well, as has been demonstrated in the last 12 months. 
there was this romantic show could just get a Labour government with a majority of things were going better and they did and they delivered devolution and then what the SNP did very smartly and very astutely is they got themselves first of all thanks to proportional representation and a fairer voting system a good thing into our parliament here in Edinburgh you're right their big hitters came up and they had big hitters coming through they didn't mm-hmm. want to go to Westminster yep. wanted to be at Holyrood and over a period of time uh, particularly after Donald's death, the SNP had a very simple message, which was, vote for us, we're Scotland's party, and we will protect you from these big bad people in London and Westminster. And particularly in the last four or five years, observing from the outside as I do these days, I watched the party I had loved and grown up in become this unionist party. Mm-hmm. It certainly wasn't a party I joined, I joined a party of home rule. It was on every little we are the party of home rule. Become the establishment and the Unionist Party be seen to the, be the, no longer the party that, whether it was through perception or otherwise, a different debate. But amongst my friends, family, and people I work with, people say, the Labour Party is not the party of change or hope anymore. It's the party that says no. Mm-hmm. And there's Alex Salmond. Vote for us, we're Scotland's party. We protect you from these big bad people in London. So, in many ways, I think the demise that we have seen for whatever period of time the demise is because things can be cyclical but they can also be very significant and deep rooted if you don't find a way through it as the Scottish Tory parties found out for the last three decades actually the demise is a simplistic one Labour in Scotland are no longer seen as Scotland's party and it's interesting you say that because see during the election I actually perceived that the Tory party in Scotland started to look like the Tory party of Scotland and the Labour Party reinforced we've sent Jim although he's from East Street, we've sent Jim Murphy up from London that was the, the that was the feeling you got Jim Murphy from the central Labour Party has come up to talk to you and tell you you're being very naughty and very silly and actually the Tories seem to get it more than mm. than Labour did well, Ruth Davidson certainly gets that and of course if Murdo Fraser had become Tory leader he wanted to rebrand and be an independent Scottish centre-right party and that, that would have been I think an incredibly sensible thing for the Conservative Party to do in Scotland because there's still of course a centre-right vote in Scotland mm-hmm. but not all of it feels comfortable with being associated with what they see as a toxic identity of of being Tory um, and you know it Next year's Holyrood elections will be very, very interesting. Um, A lot can happen in 12 months um, on a number of fronts. But I think you're right about the success of the Tory party, despite the fact, and it's interesting, they got the lowest share of the vote for a Conservative party since 1865 in Scotland. And yet there's been very little debate or attention paid to that. And that was at a time when the perception was they were more of a Scottish party. Mm -hmm. So they had a bad election result as well. However, I do think that next year in the Scottish elections that Ruth Davidson will have a good election. And where the Labour Party can find itself is getting beat across the constituencies Uh like it did this year in the first past the post part of the election and not seeing the same kind of top up in the regional lists because, in fact, the Tory party began to squeeze some of that vote in the regional list, and the Greens have a good election as well. Because I actually think your point about the Tory party touches on, I think the election in Scotland may, have, may actually be worse for Labour than people are thinking, because I think 5 or 6% of, the, of, of the, uh, what would have taken the Tories up from whatever it was, 13 14%, 18%, 19% that they get at Holyrood, I think that 5 6% junk lent its vote to the Labour Party because Labour were this yes, unionist I, party. I absolutely think that happened. I know in the polling station which I voted in uh, this year, it's a, 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 a neighbourhood I moved to in Glasgow uh, only over the last year, um, there's a, a, a more than significant Tory vote in that polling uh-huh. station. When I went up to vote and I came out and the only party canvasser outside was from the Labour Party and I was chatting to her, I didn't know her. It turned out she'd t- joined the Labour Party during the referendum because she was so motivated by protecting the union. So we had a very interesting conversation, but she told me, having lived in that part of Glasgow all her life where there has been traditionally a strong Tory vote, that uh, loads, her words, loads of her Tory friends, particularly from the tennis club, were coming and saying, 
we want Mr Cameron back as Prime Minister, but we'll vote for Tom Harris today because we must keep the SNP out. So I absolutely agree with you from that anecdotal evidence mm -hmm. that I think there was a there was quite a significant tactical vote by Tories uh, to to be to vote pro union, which lent their vote to the Labour Party. But the reality was the swing to the SNP was so big from the Labour vote. And also, the Tory vote is so small, it needs a big party to be voting tactically yeah. to have an impact. That um, next year's Holyrood election results will be the more interesting results. Because if the Tories, if, because of PR, if those people then go back, and because it's in Scotland anyway, it doesn't really matter, if those people then go back to the Tory party... Particularly the regionalist vote, where they know they sorry. can get a Tory in. And they go up to their, back up to their 18 to 20%, which they've been close to achieving at Holyrood. Yeah. So... You talked about the five problems. Labour could be on the eve of a catastrophe next year that is much worse than this year. And when I speak to friends that I still have in the Labour Party, some get that, many don't. I was just going to say, again, as an outsider, there is a bit of the way the Tories were, sort of 92 to 90, or 92, they were still in power, but they knew things were, were going, but particularly when they had... Uh, Haig, and then they had um, God, what's the other guy? Um, Michael Howard. Michael Howard, they, and then IDS. And IDS. No. You, you were watching them, thinking you're voting people in to appeal to yourselves. You've got no chance of winning based on who you've just voted in as, as the leader. And a lot of the conversation that I see and read from from Labour people, one one half seems to be saying we need to completely go back to New Labour and reinvigorate it. And the other half seems to be saying we need to go completely back to the left. Which gets back to your five mm. points. So how do you resolve those those five points? Because it seems very difficult to resolve the party that needs to talk to the floating voter in the southeast of England, who needs to talk to the disenfranchised, who who the floating voter's gone Tory down there. Yeah. Also needs to talk to the guy who's gone SNP up here because Labour's not left-wing enough. Mm. How do you resolve that? Well, n now with great difficulty. Many of us argued post-evolution inside the Scottish Labour Party for two things that we thought were very, very important. One was autonomy from the UK Labour Party to reflect the devolved settlement. And in fact, a pressure group that I was a member of prior to devolution called Scottish Labour Action were arguing for that autonomy. Um, and taking it to the floor of conference in the Labour Party prior to devolution. But anyway, post-devolution, many of us were arguing that the Labour Party in Scotland had to become autonomous so that we could do exactly what the SNP have done over the last six months, which is say, vote for us, we'll send a block of Scottish Labour MPs to support a UK Labour government, but we will negotiate the terms in which we support that Labour Prime Minister in the interests of Scotland. Now, there's nothing new in this, Harry, because... That's what the Scottish Unionist Party did, who were really the Scottish Tory party. Mm -hmm. Everybody knew they were voting for Anthony Eden to be Prime Minister. But they knew that those Scottish Unionists and progressives, as they called themselves in those days, mainly council level, were going down to London to negotiate a deal that was in the interest of Scotland and, 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 and vote with the Tory whip. So we were arguing that we should have that autonomy from 1999 onwards. We could never win that debate, particularly because the Westminster members of Parliament were so entrenched in that bubble and part of... To be frank, it looked and it felt like they, they, they were slow, it was so entrenched in being part of the establishment of Westminster that they resisted any further change in that. There was no chance of any radical change when Donald died because it's Donald Dewar that carried the Labour Party on that journey because everybody trusted Donald and his judgment in devolution. Um, and the second thing that many of us were arguing for in the Labour Party post-devolution was the fact that it, having devolution in Scotland alone was not sustainable for the whole of this island. And we were arguing that the Labour Party... The Labour Party's answer initially was, well, the regional assemblies in England, they were quickly rejected as a concept. Yep. Now, John Prescott couldn't sell that to the east of England. It wasn't going to happen anywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, and... Many of us then began to argue um, it, it, that we had to have some form of federalism. Why do the English not deserve to have their own parliament and their own voice? They're the mm -hmm. oldest nation in Europe, and yet they're the only nation in the European Union that doesn't have its own 
Parliament speaking for it, like mm. we do in Scotland. No wonder you kept capitalising that, because there is, in England now, I just think, a crisis of identity about being English is. Yeah. So we have this just whole unsustainable mess, which the Labour Party is kind of really caught up in the middle of, and is not providing any solutions. Um, where they go from here, I have absolutely no idea, with great difficulty, and they'll have to be very, very patient, because I think it will take a long, long time for the Labour Party re to rebuild a credibility. Certainly in Scotland, I don't know England as well as I know my, my home country, um, but a long time before it can rebuild its credibility and for for a lot of its members to be prepared to make the change that the Scottish Labour Party has to make to rebuild that credibility. Do you see any sign of that debate happening? Well, the debate's happening. People are calling for autonomy. Uh, people that I, I'm surprised would call, would call for it. So, I mean, that's a start in the right direction. The Scottish Labour Party has to become an independent party in Scotland. We need an alternative to the Scottish National Party in government. I would say this, if Labour were in government with a kind of mandate that the SNP now have across Holyrood, um, across the Westminster seats, and, and, and inevitably at this rate we'll have across the whole government, we all want a healthy democracy as Democrats. You would need an independent Labour Party to be that counterbalance, otherwise you'll suddenly find that Ruth Davidson will be the opposition leader, and how comfortable will traditional Labour people feel about that? Well, that, that's one of the things that I, I was going to say, because you look at it and you think, if it's a systemic issue for the Labour Party and it's, it's following the route of the Unionists, who were the only party ever to achieve, much as the SNP got close, the only party yes. ever to achieve more than 50% of a vote in an election in Scotland, the Unionists achieved it, um, and have gone. If the Labour Party isn't a blip, we actually have a, it's maybe not too, maybe a, a too strong way to put it, but a, a constitutional problem in Scotland that we have no opposition. If the if if Labour dropped down to being a twenty twenty five percent vote, and the, and the Conservatives are twenty percent, okay between them that's still yep. nearly fifty percent, but the dominance that the SNP would then have is not healthy. Of course, nobody wants to live in an unhealthy democracy, although I'd be a slight hypocrite if I didn't say that I didn't enjoy the almost absolute power that being leader of Glasgow Labour Group did during a period of time. Um, when you have majority government and you don't have a lot of challenge, although incidentally, that was probably perhaps partly my own downfall. A, benevol too. a benevolent dictatorship is uh, not such a bad thing, I, is it? I, well, I'm glad, Provided it's our opinion, uh, well, it's in charge. Uh, <laughs> indeed, and I'm glad that you, you give me that accolade, given we don't generally share politics. So um, I'll, I'll accept that, that compliment. But you know, autonomy for the Labour Party, before it goes down the road that you describe, is very, very important. Um, now, there are many friends of mine in the Labour Party that argue it's a sideshow about structures and it's about conceding to nationalism and other things. I don't. I think the Labour Party's got a serious, serious problem of identity in Scotland with its traditional vote and indeed with other voters and the new voters. The voters, the generation that only remember the evolution. You talked earlier about the Celtic fans that don't remember a pre-Fergus McCann yeah. Loads and loads of voters, including the younger members of my family, don't remember anything about the Scottish Parliament. They don't have any connection with Westminster. So if we don't get that autonomy right as a, 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 in terms of a form of an independent Labour Party or a rebrand or whatever, but certainly full autonomy, we can't get the second thing that's important. And incidentally, the first is now really important because Joanne Lamont, when she resigned, said, we've been treated as the branch office. Now, that's a, a very senior figure who would be seen as part tradition of the union's wing mm -hmm. of the Scottish Labour Party. Now, that resonated with a lot of voters, and you know, I had many discussions with people about that, so it has to be dealt with. Before you get to the second thing, which is the next thing that builds the, the credibility, is someone with substance has to have vision. Because whether you agree with the vision of the SNP, or whether you agree that Alex Sam is the best thing since sliced bread, which many did, not all, or you have the status that Nicola has, which is Nicola. Mm -hmm. Very few politicians are called, called yep. by the first thing. That means people feel an attachment. Labour then needs to have a leader of substance and connection with people that has vision. And at the moment, we have a very clear leader of substance in Nicola Sturgeon with a very clear vision, which is about putting Scotland's interests forward, Scotland's voice heard at Westminster... And, of course, she doesn't hide the fact that she ultimately wants Scotland to be independent. What's Labour's message? 
Correct. We look at each other. The only message it seemed to have was the party that no longer represents change. You once represented the change. You once represented Home Rule. You once represented hope. Now, friends of mine in the party say, Stephen, come on, we were in favour of abolishing zero-hour contracts. We were going to introduce the living wage. These things are a given. People expect the Labour Party to do that. Back to where we started this interview around fans' expectations yeah. about, you know, these are a given when we're comparing it to the Labour Party around welfare. People said, we expect you to do that. What's your vision for Scotland? Who's your leader? And what's their vision? And do we believe in it? Do we buy in? Does it give us hope? And I think we fell in as a party, latterly when I was involved with the Labour Party, maybe I was part of it as well, to, I'm on, I hope not, to, to, to becoming negative and saying no all the time. And I think that's the biggest perception problem the Labour Party has. They look like a party that says no and has no clear, distinct, positive vision for change mm-hmm. for Scotland. Yeah, uh, that was the overriding thing I got is don't vote with the SNP because that's bad. Yeah. Yeah, but what you, your point... And it, this, was the, this was the overriding thing for me watching the two years of the referendum. It went from always 28 to 30% in favour of independence in the polls forever in, in, in my lifetime. And I think there was an element of being lulled into, oh, we won by 10%. It was 45, 55. No, look at the journey in the two years to 45. It went, it went 50% up. And the 50% increase was based, I perceived, on things can be better than this. Yeah. It was a bit, it was a, yes, it was a message of change, but it was a message of change based on this is not as good as it gets. Yeah. It can be better. So the next obvious question that people listening to this would then ask is, who's that guy who will give the hope? Would it ever be you? <laughs> I don't think it will ever be me. I think I've done my stint in the Labour Party in uh, Scotland and I was a very privileged person and was involved with the Labour Party and with Glasgow at a great time. It was a time of great change and we did have a Labour government that wanted to work with us. And indeed, when an SNP government came into power that wanted to work with the city, we made tremendous achievements. I don't think that person has emerged yet in Labour that will be the great visionary that takes Scottish Labour or whatever is reborn out of the ashes just now to its next chapter or a wholly new book in the history of Scottish politics. But they will emerge because everything is cyclical. We just never know what the cycle is. Well, to take us full cycle on the podcast, I better get back to Celtic. So I'm looking at how long this has been, so I'm not going to keep you any longer. I'll, I'll have my final Celtic questions a bit briefer. Have you enjoyed the past season and what have you made of Ronnie Dyer? Yeah, I have thoroughly enjoyed the last season. Um, Ronnie Dyler, I think he's a terrific manager. What do I like about him? He's a great attention to detail. Um, I like the approach which is based on uh, developing people and developing you know, footballers as you know, 24-7 athletes. It's about their nutrition. It's about their state of mind. Um, it's about them being ambassadors for their club and their football. It's about the whole approach... Um, and the fact that it, I think it's been refreshing that the board and I think generally the support have given him the season to prove that that was the right approach and he's, he's shaping and moulding that ethos within the team and it's quite interesting uh, to watch we're playing great attacking football mm-hmm. which is, you know, that, that, that makes the, the heart beat when you're, when, you're, when you're watching the game uh, it, the defensive record speaks for itself, you know. The, the, it's, you know, considering that in effect we play with two full backs who are wingers, uh, yeah. in effect we two at the back. <laughs> you know, it's any of the best defensive record in a hundred years. <laughs> in a hundred years, so you know, we've made history again. <laughs> yes, and if we know our history, a big part of being part of the Celtic family is is, is history. Um, you know, it, off to a bumpy start at the beginning because he was taking a radically different approach. But by October, I think it was October, we were in. Yeah. In, in front in, in, in the league and um, there's been some particular high points and a couple of low points but I think it's been a good season 
partly because I think this manager's actually quite an exciting manager, which is not maybe we thought of him yep. on almost a year to the day that uh, he was appointed in early June uh, last year. He takes a very interesting and different approach from many other managers. But ultimately, what is the main test? We've got the league title. Yep. That's the highest accolade. Okay. Well, I have kept you long enough, Stephen Purcell. It's been an absolute pleasure. The great thing about being semi-retired these days and not having to work for the manic hours that I used to is that you can you can become part of the chattering classes. <laughs> so I don't know if I'm betraying my working class Celtic labour roots or not, but there you are. You're, you're an aspiration. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Oh, I wish I was in Glasgow with some good old friends of mine some good old rough companions and some good old smooth red wine we could talk about the old days and the old town sad decline and drink to the boys on the road so hope you enjoyed that podcast with mr stephen purcell number 250 a review of the season will be along very shortly, along with a couple of other special guests pending. So we won't be taking a break for the summer like some lesser known podcasts. Anyway, um, I said at the beginning of the podcast, I'd give you a wee bit more about the Celtic FC Foundation. I think there was over 100 people who helped sell the badges, which raised £17,000 uh, for Badge Day. The Zip Slide in March raised over £30,000. The annual sports dinner in March raised over £70,000. And the CSC Foundation is one of the things that we can all be truly thankful and proud for about the club. If you want to know more about getting involved with anything the Foundation do, and I think, although it's running very tight in time to collect your money, there are just a handful of places left for the High Cup Bay Nevis for the Huddle, a peak atop uh, Britain's highest peak you can go to CFC Foundation at CelticFC.co.uk that's CFC Foundation at CelticFC.co.uk or telephone 0141 551 4321 anyway enough of me that was him Stephen Purcell with me Harry Brady saying God bless and good night good night as we go our separate ways Oh, but Glasgow gave me more Than it ever took away And prepared me for life on the road My granny was a cleaner My granddad drove a tram my father, an engineer, made me all I am. They have seen the city come and go, still they give a damn. There's so much to learn along the road. And Glasgow gave me more than it ever took away and prepared me for life on the road.